to the tune of Juniper Springs, uh, an original composition by Adam Klein. We are now presenting again the Cable Easel here on Channel 6. It's a program dedicated to painting and drawing live today. Sometimes we're not live. And if you have a question about what I'm doing or about what you're doing, or even just a general question about painting and drawing, call me. Uh, I'm here for the purpose of trying to answer some of the questions. 473-8853, I believe, or is it 928? I've, it's extraordinary. I've done, been doing this for eight years. There it is, 473-8853. I'm right. Uh, you'd think that after seven years I'd be able to remember the number. But nevertheless, there it is on the screen for you to call, 473-8853. And um, the oracle is here, waiting to answer your questions if I can. I have brought in uh, an original setup because I have been talking now for a long time that there is no magic about any of this business of painting and drawing. It is pure observation, craft, and obsession, I suppose, is the best term. Uh, working from life is what I uh, am continually expounding, as opposed to other public television programs. It's all uh, supplies available to you at the local store for the same price that I pay. I've brought my um, paints in and I've got them on a piece of black board because I'm working in a kind of a black uh, theme tonight to show you when you see the um, camera pick up the setup that I've got um, laid out here in a composition which is dealing with the simplest possible composition and I call it a parade painting uh, because obviously those little objects familiar to all of us are just on parade. They're lined up uh, going uh, nowhere but they are in a in a kind of a straight line. They are not uh, in a circular composition, they're not in a rectangular, they're not radiating, they are just sitting there in a perfectly straight line. I've got them on a black background and what I've done is prepared a canvas uh, with black paint so that you can kind of, well maybe here I've just dropped my cloth and painting without a cloth is like painting without brushes. You've got to have a cloth to keep your brush clean. So here I've got my colors squeezed onto a black piece of uh, canvas board. I've got a piece of black board right here that I'm working on just for a very simple instructional reason that it's going to eliminate all the problems that a complicated background can give you. So, uh, with this setup, and it's not tricky, it is just a simplification of the problem of applying paint to canvas. Let me, let us look in on how I'm going to place these objects and the simplicity with which I'm going to try to do it. So, here we go. I'm using uh, clear turpentine with a touch of white paint to act like a sort of a white pencil on this black prepared background. I'm going to place the uh, subject matter. Here is the lime, just placing it. I'm not going to attempt to do anything more than placing this object. Is this very much at an angle? Maybe it would be better if I were to turn this around. Is that a little bit better? Well, maybe if I, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I can, I can tilt it forward so that it is less distorted. Uh, have, I, have I done a bad thing? Uh, maybe that's better. Here is the yellow apple, um, uh, just, as I say, uh, in its position. Uh, it's lovely to work with still life because still life uh, doesn't move, as opposed to people. And if you pick uh, items or motifs 
that rot more slowly than flowers fade, then you have the chance of being, if you begin a, a still life with things that are cooperative and don't rot away uh, before your eyes, you will find that you can go back to it when you have time. Now, onions don't rot very fast. They tend to sprout a little bit and get little green things coming out of their tops. But um, apples do very nicely for a number of days, maybe even a week or better. And um, uh, pomegranates don't change. That's the pomegranate that I'm doing right now. All available in the local market. No glamorous uh, photographic reference work that you might be uh, copying. This is all directly from life. Now I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. A lot of people say don't use even numbers. Well, that's a lot of baloney. You can use all the even numbers you want to. Odd numbers are only for uh, what you might call very contrived compositions. If I happen to have six, six items which look well together, so let it be six. If it offends me later, I'll add one and make it seven. Anyway, I've got a kind of a limited palette. This doesn't look like me. It isn't many colors. It's one, two, three. Okay, I'll, I'll name them. Flesh, ochre, orange, vermilion, sienna, sap green, raw sienna, black. I rarely use black. Bright yellow, which is cadmium yellow, cerulean blue, a little, uh, a little sort of a manufactured color called uh, olive, uh, light olive green. Don't have to have this one, but it's really very convenient. And ultramarine blue. That's, and white, of course. That is a limited palette. Well, let us get really close and see how the application of this paint is going to go, because that's the point, to see how you apply paint. I'm not using a four-inch wall house painting brush. Uh, I am using a, um, well, it's a $6 sable square cut brush, nice and soft. It will cooperate. This is a lime. But it's got a beautiful reflected light from the yellow apple. I'm going to put this pale color in first. Very simply applied. And because I, I like to go from pale to dark a good deal of the time, uh, you may, this may turn out to look very, very yellow. But I'm going to bring in the green. And as it turns around and begins to go the other side, it gets darker. But with oils, as you can see, the blend is very uh, simple. I mean, simple. It's simple if you know how to mix the colors. And this is what I'm trying to get. And if you have questions about mixing colors, call me. I'm using them fairly pure off the palette. I don't find any need right now to subdue them in any way. But I do want to show you how with one brush, not a big one at that. See the size of that one? That's not that, that's not that small. It's really not a four inch house brush, as I said before. There are some of the most ludicrous programs going on, teaching, painting, and drawing, which are so absurd. And <laughs> I just hope that the people who watch those can kind of sort out the absurdity of calling things black magic and white magic and, oh, my, uh, you know, anything goes kind of magic. Uh, it's just dumb. And it's a waste of time and materials and energy to, uh, you know, get involved in that kind of stuff. Anyway, um, so I'm trying to uh, approach it more in the classical manner and give you not secrets, but really solid information as to how to do this. I'm now using the cadmium yellow and a touch of the white. And uh, I'm going to be working from one side of this yellow apple to the other. And as you can see, I'm going to leave the space for the shadow, which is being cast by this lime. You see, what happens when you work from life is you've got all the information you need right in front of you. You don't have to say, well, this will do, and if you want to, you can do so and so, and maybe you could just throw a little bit of something in here. That's, that's not the way you paint from life, and that's not the way you paint. You, if you are recording things in any kind of a an honest way, you're going to go to the original source and you're going to attempt and really put, put out the effort to do it in an honest way, not just let like anything will do. That's fake. It's fake. It's just, just, it, it just um, uh, well, it's a waste of time, period. Now, as you can see, the blend is, is working very nicely because it's oils. Oils are so friendly. They uh, are directly opposite acrylics that dry too fast, resist you. 
they uh, cause more problems than life is worth putting into. And so uh, take the oils. Of course, oils are toxic. They are a base of lead and they are uh, soluble in turpentine and linseed oil, which is nothing to be fooled around with. So I assume that people who are going to paint are going to understand that the materials you're using can be, should be watched. Um, acrylics are no less poisonous if you get them in your food, so uh, let's, not, let's not think that... Um, and watercolors, they all, they ever, all of these supplies have got something uh, that has to be watched out for. Okay, as I am... Uh, uh, Traveling along here, I am watching my subject matter with great care and using as much subtle information as I can. This little, this little area here where the, where the apple is depressed and goes in, that doesn't mean that it's unhappy. There's a depression in here, which means that the stem is growing out of this little uh, miniature volcano kind of thing, in inverted volcano. Forgive these terms, but I'm trying to find ones that are, well, familiar to all of us and uh, that are descriptive. So uh, it is the inside of a little apple volcano down there, and um, uh, there is a shadow being cast. I'm going I'm to change now to a smaller brush, because although a little shadow might not seem uh, pertinent, it is. It's, it gives you that third dimensional quality. I'm using a paler, I'm using a yellow ochre for this little shadow of the stem. You'll see in a minute what great fun it is to be able to give a third dimensional effect with something as simple as just one miniature shadow. Here comes the little stem done in pure uh, sienna. Uh, it is not much more complicated than that. One does not have to worry about putting a, um, a great shadow on this. It's purely uh, functional, that this little stick sticking out of here is what that apple hung on to for all those months before they picked it. Well, as you can see, that has worked. It has given you the uh, illusion, which is all the painting is, that there is a depression in here, a little hole in there, and this stem is growing out of it. We can get really very uh, classic and give you the top of that stem with a little touch right here that will tell you that the light is falling even on something as insignificant as the top of this little stem. Well, now we let, let's deal with this little shadow that is running down the side of this, uh, of this yellow apple. I'm going to use a bit of ochre. Uh, you must stay within the same range as the apple's color. You wouldn't certainly put, a lot of, a lot of uh, contemporary uh, painters would put a purple shadow in here. Uh, and that's fine if you're doing a contemporary uh, impressionistic work. But I am trying to give you the classic approach to painting. And uh, the classic approach is to paint what you see. And when you've mastered that, then you can take the uh, freedom bus and go off on a tangent of impressionistic, uh, fant fanciful, uh, painting, which can be listed as all with all sorts of terms, but the basics have got to be learned first, and that's what I'm trying to uh, impart to you. All right, with a little bit of pure white, because we're not dealing with glass here, uh, uh, I'm going to give you the highlight of this apple. I'm going to put it on pure, and then I'm going to diffuse it a little bit, because that the surface of this apple is not a Christmas ball, it is a piece of skin. If it was a Christmas ball, you would not diffuse the highlight at all. You would let it remain totally uh, stark. Here, you must diffuse it just a trifle because you do have a skin texture to deal with. Well, now we're going to have a holiday from the uh, greens and the yellows and go off into the next one, which is, I'm working from left to right, which is probably very... Well, we write from left to right, so it's a rather easy way uh, to understand what is happening. Uh, I've got a pure vermilion that I'm going to attempt here. I didn't bring any alizarin crimson. It was foolish. I packed my colors tonight, and I uh, forgot the alizarin crimson. So because uh, there is a lack of uh, the proper color, I'm going to have to improvise with this alizarin crimson. Uh, the apple will turn out to be a little bit more... Um, a little bit paler red than the actual one I'm using. We, you know that these uh, delicious, uh, red delicious apples have a blood dark red color about them. And I'm going to have to use some of this um, sienna tone, a little bit of this, uh, a little bit of the, um, 
uh, ultramarine blue to try to get the dog red. It's much better if you have the proper colors uh, on your palette. However, when you're stuck out there in the middle of no place and the art store is 25 miles away, you make do with what you have. And what I have here is this, are these three tones, the sienna, uh, ultramarine, and cadmium red or vermilion sometimes it's called. Um, I'm, I'm going from light to dark, exactly as I see it there. There's going to be a ring of light here because that's the way that apple happens to be built. Um, the center part of it is facing me directly. I took some care to set up this, uh, this little still life so that um, uh, I can also talk to you a little bit about uh, the selection of subject matter and the fact that the creation of a painting uh, has got to do almost entirely with the selection of the subject matter. Uh, if you decide to paint a horse, that's the painting. If you decide to paint a still life, that's the painting, or a portrait, or an onion. So it's the thought and the selection of the subject matter which comes first. The supplies come a long time later. The craftsmanship comes in as well. I'm going to switch my little brushes now, get to this smaller brush, which is this one right here, because I'm going to be dealing with a rather small area. And here is a little place where this stem was growing and it broke off. And so this part of it is pale and the other is quite dark. And I hope that that's not too small and too subtle to see, because there it is. Um, now that ring of light that goes around the uh, apple uh, is because this is the uh, volcano, the little apple volcano, seen from above. Um, the little depression is in there, and here is the outer rim of the, of the apple's uh, uh, swollen top. The apple is, of course, lying on its side. I'm diffusing this because the apple is shiny, but it is, as I said about the other one, it's not as shiny as glass. Textures are interesting to me. They are, um, they're around us everywhere. We, are, we wear textures, we have textures in our person, and uh, the texture of things is uh, vital to painting realistically. You know very well that when you're out cleaning the car and polishing it, the texture of the car is what is interesting. It's rarely really the color. It's the texture, the shininess, the surface. And we're dealing in painting with surfaces. Uh, this is never talked about in the other shows on public television. The other shows on public television seem to be concerned only with the trickiness of something, uh, which escapes me every time I watch them. All right, we have now progressed from left to right with the rendering, which is what this is, of three motifs. They are all spherical. Well, that's a pretty, pretty educated word, I must say, so I think I'll use a more common word. They're round. They are ball-like. And the wonderful thing about working with these spheres, these circles, these globes, little globes, is that they are the preamble to all other painting. If you can paint an apple or a lemon or a cantaloupe or a whatever that is, is the shape of a globe, you can then paint a cheek and a belly and an eye and the tip of a nose. Uh, you have learned what it is uh, to, you, that you must do in order to get the illusion of a sphere, something that goes around. Um, it's vital for you, if you're a realistic painter, to be able to do that. That's why if you practice on apples that don't care what they look like, I mean, there isn't an apple in the world that's going to care if you've made it round or square, but the painter cares, and so does the viewer, and so does, even more important, the buyer. If the buyer cares, you'd better uh, be sure that, if you want to sell that picture, you better be sure that you are going to please the buyer's sense of logic. And the thing that I experience when my people come and see my paintings is that they, because they're looking for realistic painting, they say, oh, it looks so real. Well, that doesn't just happen. It is a concerted effort, and it is an absolute deliberate 
technique that I have to make it uh, so that the comments are, oh, it looks so real. Before I went on the air, I cheated a little bit, and I put this glow of this black background, and all, and all black is not just dense black. It's got varying tones of black. And what was so interesting to me is that back here, this apple is such so dark red and it, that it is showing almost black itself against this glow of a black drape. Now, can you imagine anything more perplexing than a red apple against a black drape, but it's the apple that appears black and the drape appears pale? All in the business of observation and playing uh, with the problems of rendering these things uh, just as you see them. So you've got a play of light here, this darkness against this pale black background. Sort of amazing. Now this apple, I'm going to rinse this brush a little bit, and I'd like you to see here, I'm going to bring it right close. This is my turpentine brush. It's half of one of those cans of Coca-Cola. I forgot mine, and there's my turpentine. Only use very little of it. Do not use a whole can of turpentine. It's too expensive. It gets dirty and dark, and you can't throw it away because it's a whole quart. It costs two and a half dollars or more. So use small quantities of turpentine uh, that you can just chuck carefully in a place that won't matter, namely uh, somewhere on a pavement, and eventually the rain will wash it away and dilute it. Do not pollute the world with your paints and your oils and all those other chemicals that seem to be being poured willy-nilly into all sorts of places. Uh, get rid of your uh, turpentine and paints in a respectful manner. This apple turned kind of green and yellow in places. It uh, suddenly, it decided to have a little green spot. Now, my son Adam will laugh at that because he says you always make it anthropomorphic by giving uh, these things a uh, emotions. There is the setup. I'm now on the fourth apple, the one which is fourth from the left. Working on that one and working my way towards the completion of this, uh, of this uh, still life, we have a long way to go, even though we're zipping right along. And as you see, I'm sitting at a, um, well, this is a um, secretarial uh, piece of furniture. It holds, no, no, it looks like a music stand. This is what it is, it's a music stand. It's very convenient because I can look over the top of it onto the still life. Well, we have to deal with another little crater here. And that little crater is also pale inside, as the others were. So I'm using a touch of the pale green. And complicated business uh, over here. The crater has got some green in it. But it also has got a very dark shadow being cast by the apple on its left. So here we are. Is there any way of getting really much closer to that? Because I'm dealing with something so small here, I'm not sure that that is visible. Uh, well, maybe it is. I don't know. Uh, I'd better just pay attention to this and let the, let, uh, the uh, there we go. The business of getting in close, you see, I'm close to it, and I, and I sort of like to share the closeness of, of that uh, problem. Yeah, that's wonderful. Oh, great. You see, because here we're dealing with this extremely dark shadow. This is being cast over this apple from the other one. And the drama of this kind of painting is that these shadows are so intense. This rarely happens unless you are working under uh, artificial light. In the daytime, uh, the light is much gentler, much softer, uh, and much more what we're used to. But here, under the, under the lights, uh, they are dramatic. That's fine. Dramatic uh, lighting is um, very instructive. It gives you the chance to really observe a great deal about what you're seeing. So, uh, here we are. We have now dealt with the same problem four times. But each time it's different, and each time it presents a different problem, and each time you have to go back to the reference material. You don't just take this first apple and say, well, that apple has got to be doing the same thing as the other one, because it doesn't. It changes. It is not a formula. It isn't like whacking a nail into a 2 by 4 every 16 inches or every 12 inches, whereby the 
the activity is repeated uh, in the same way. It's not repeated. It can't possibly be repeated because the light is different. Here is the shadow of that stem coming out over this apple. And I'm going to go back to my little smaller brush and give you that stem, which by this time is not like the other one. It's pale. This one happens to be a pale stem. The other one was uh, darker and ochre colored. This one is almost peach toned. So as I say, working from life is uh, far easier because your information is given to you by the subject. And um, your eventual buyer or viewer of this work is going to recognize the fact that there is a realism here which is totally mystifying and very intriguing. Um, not that there is anything wrong or even anything bad, and I love abstract painting, and I've done it a number of times, and there's nothing wrong, but that's not what I'm teaching here. Uh, I'm, I'm teaching uh, the lack of magic in painting. Uh, this is the no magic painting uh, program. This is the uh, deliberate, still life, on purpose, observational lesson in how to paint in the realistic manner. All right, we now have also we had now have the fourth, and you know, uh, repetition is the great teacher. If you repeat it often enough, it's going to stay there. Now I've repeated this uh, this uh, problem of painting a sphere four times. Guess what? I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it six times this evening. Uh, you can tune out, of course. Uh, there are 64 other channels, or at least 35 other channels. However, I suggest that you hang out and watch what happens when you really, when you really can, you know, put the seatbelt on here with this still life and stay with the problem. I've got a black background and I am putting in a black shadow. Very perplexing. However, it is working because black is black to a certain point. What I prepared this with was a uh, spray can of black, and it says black on the label, but as you can all see, it wasn't really black. This is black right here. So uh, the, there are degrees, not just of whites, but there are degrees of blacks. And uh, when you are uh, uh, working with the subtlety of this kind of thing, you learn an awful lot about tone and about the application and about the seriousness of what paint does. Okay, we can get uh, make jokes if we want to, but let's just stick with this for a moment. There is a missing part to my lime over here, and that's its little growing place. So, but I am going to put these shadows into anchor. Uh, these motifs so that they are not floating about in the Pleiades, way up there somewhere in the spears, along with uh, Mr. Halley's uh, toy. Uh, these are not hanging loose in the atmosphere. They are anchored to a black background. Oh, well, I've got a goof there. I've got to get that out of there. Anyway, as you can see, these have all of a sudden now become, uh, they are now sitting. They're now sitting where they ought to. I'm going to be able to uh, 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 make uh, the bottom of this apple a little bit more subtle in a while, maybe a little bit darker because it is going around in a circle and it's folding underneath here and it should be less bright than the top. Not very, not very, uh, not, not a real whapper of, a, of an observation, but nevertheless it, uh, the fact that this goes under here should be paid attention to because the top is the brightest part. That's where the light is hitting. Now you can see that oils are very nice things to deal with. They can be reworked. They can be blended. Uh, you can put layer upon layer of it. You can obliterate mistakes. You can add, subtract, and multiply with oils, which, which many times is not possible with other medium. Watercolor is the uh, maddening uh, agent. Watercolor is when you make the mistake, you've made the mistake and that's it. You either shoot yourself tear the, or tear the page off and start over. But with oils, you can go back and change your mind and correct errors, as I'm doing here with this yellow apple that needed to have a little bit more um, 
a little bit more careful observation, a little bit more careful shading as it went around the bend. Now, if we progress over to the right, I'm going to be now uh, uh, doing the lime. This apple is casting a very dark shadow behind itself onto that nice glow, and it's going to be giving the lime, which is very bright yellow, a nice dense background against which to be very bright and shiny. So here I've put this, uh, the shadow of the fourth apple, and we're, I think we're out of the apple market now. We're now going to progress into limes and pomegranates. By the way, if anybody has never eaten a pomegranate, uh, don't fail to do so. They are absolutely fascinating and beautiful to look at when you open them. They look like somebody has given you a handful of rubies. And they're juicy and a little tart and taste a little bit like, um, well, like cranberry juice. But they are, oh, so beautiful to look at and quite wonderful to paint. Well, uh, with a mixture of cadmium yellow, some of that nice sap green, uh, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the top of this line, which is very brilliant, and being helped to be brilliant with the darkness of that apple's shadow. As I said last time I was on, which I think was before Election Day, um, there is nothing that is uh, bright without darkness. If you don't have it very dark, you cannot get it very bright. I always use this, the, the uh, example of the, um, the cigarette light, which was the, cigar the lit cigarette which was visible on the ground from an enemy plane. Uh, and uh, that uh, just a pinpoint of light in intense darkness makes for brilliance. Uh, the reason that this is so brilliant is because of the darkness behind it. It would not seem this brilliant if it was against this gray. That's very clear, and I find no need to repeat that again. It's, uh, it's just the logistics of the placement of color. Here's the little nipple that uh, comes out of a lime's... Uh, uh, end here, the little growing place, and even though it's, it seems unimportant, it isn't, even this little um, uh, uh, nipple casts a shadow. It makes for the third dimensional look of realistic painting. Uh, it can be only found by working this way from life. Well, you know what? It's getting on. It's, we're doing actually quite well, and I'm going to be able to have the time. Would, you, would anybody like to sort of pull back and get the general overall look of this thing as, um, as I'm working? And then we can see just how far it's gone. Now, there's, um, uh, that's how far uh, you can go. You don't have to agonize over this, and I grant you, I know I've been doing this for a long time. And, well, my sister's among the people who say, oh, it is so awful to hear her say it's simple. It isn't. I've never said it was simple. But I am trying to give you the simpler, the, the more direct way of painting in this manner. Um, the direct way is by working with observation as the, one of the foremost ingredients for this kind of painting. And then I guess you have to be possessed by the desire to do this and by uh, the ability to select your subject matter. Uh, if you have problems with that, go to the classics. Get yourself into the library and thumb through the books of the classic, well, let's take still life painters. The classic still life painters are uh, Chardin, C-H-A-R-D-I-N, uh, Raphael Peel, Rembrandt Peel, these are Americans, Chardin was French, of course. Raphael and Rembrandt Peel, I guess their mamas must have known that they were going to be painters. She gave them painters' names to begin with. They grew up to be known as Raphael and Rembrandt. Isn't that, wasn't that thoughtful of the, Mrs. Peel? Uh, and um, uh, then, uh, of course, the Spaniards uh, have Velasquez and um, Murillo. Remarkable still life painting. Van Gogh was no slouch, neither was Gauguin, neither was Cezanne. All of these people uh, with this remarkable legacy, left a remarkable legacy of fabulous uh, still life painting. The Dutch, the Dutch still life painters with all those names that start with V-A-N and unpronounceable really. Um, 
uh, the source of material and supplies that you have in the library uh, must be tapped if you uh, want to be self-taught. I'm self-taught. You don't have to find a, a classroom and a, and a course and a school for which you may not have the time to go at night. You may have to stay home with children. You may have to, I don't know, just not go out. And you can, in fact, teach yourself. We have, we have the most remarkable libraries. Um, you can have subscriptions of things like the Metropolitan Museum of Art seminars, which, will, which you can subscribe to. It's expensive sometimes, but for the most time, even one of those three and a half dollar books in the art stores. They're not the greatest, but they will give you a basis of reference of how to start this kind of painting. If you uh, get, can't get it from what I do on the, uh, on the program here, and it goes too fast, get a book and do it from a book. Pomegranates are funny. Let me stop lecturing you on how to go about teaching yourself. Pomegranates are funny. They've got bumpy places. Uh, and it doesn't look like they make much sense, but it's the characteristic of the fruit that you've got to get in order to be a realistic painter. This pomegranate has got a kind of a bunch of bumps, probably from rude handling in the supermarket, but they probably all come off the tree nice and round and shiny, but they get whacked around. So if that's the way they look, paint them. Don't eliminate the uh, scars. Uh, either that or these bumps are, in fact, uh, indigenous to this fruit. But it looks to me like they've been manhandled. So we had, and we also have some reflected light underneath there, and we have a little bit of uh, darkness under here because this thing is going underneath. And as you can see, my lack of alizarin crimson is giving me a maybe a little bit less uh, rich tone to this pomegranate, but uh, it is uh, giving you the, um, the information of how you do the blending. Well, I'm going to have to give that glow to the background once again in order to be able to get that delicious darkness on this side of the pomegranate. That's a little bit too light. So let me uh, put a little bit of, but the black cloth has a glow. I don't, I'm not going to question it. I'm not going gonna, gonna, gonna to find out why this black felt uh, backdrop that uh, Channel 6 has here for its uh, other programs. I'm sure that if you watch this channel, you see the interview programs and they change the colors of these drapes. I always get a black one. It makes me look as though I'm suspended in space. There is the, um, and it's lovely because it eliminates all the, um, unnecessary details of color and get concentrating on what I'm doing, which is working with color. So here is the dark side of the pomegranate. Looking dark now because I have given the background the lightness that it needed to show the darkness of the side of the pomegranate. Exactly the same problem that we had with the apple over there on the left, but it's just a different shape. And these are the things which make it such great fun to work with the um, to work with still lives. This 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 shadow here becomes very dark. We haven't gotten any calls. It's interesting. And maybe the phones aren't working. Maybe there aren't any calls. Maybe what I'm doing is so intriguing that nobody is wanting to miss a stroke, so they have not taken the time to call. That's fine. I run into people all, uh, in my travels all the time, and they say they watch and that they are sometimes a little bit too shy to call, or they're watching so carefully that they don't take the time to call. That's fine. However, you're missing an opportunity to, to um, badger me about your problems, and that's okay. Now, I'm now once again dealing with black on black. Black has sh shades, something that will, will come only when you observe it. Well, the top of that pomegranate, well, this pomegranate certainly has got a bunch of highlights. Let's put a highlight on it. All these fruits have highlights because they're round. There are circles and they have their highlights. This one's got a funny, funny bunch of odd shaped ones because of the odd shape of the bumps on it. And there it kind of dips down like that. And this one is very bright. There we are. Now, up here, there's a different kind of uh, cavity. Uh, that's the word I looked for. I used volcano before. What, what a dumb statement. This is the cavity of the pomegranate and it is different than the apple. Uh, the inside of the pomegranate is pale uh, sienna colored. And because the light is coming from here, 
light's coming from here. This side of the cavity is dark, just like a cup, except that this is tiny. This is a little, this is like a, a little, the inside of a little glass almost. And here we have the uh, dark side of this aperture. This grows differently than apples. And it's casting a little bit of a shadow over here. And we also have, I'm going to get a little tiny brush. There's also a little area at the top of this. It's kind of a lip. Uh, that, is, that is because there is a thickness to this skin. It doesn't look like much, but it's absolutely vital to tell the story of how this thing is growing. There we are. Well, we have a call. Well, somebody finally decided not to be too shy. Good evening. Who are you? Uh, yes, ma'am. Paul. I'm from Port Jeff Station. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'd like to know, where do you get those plum grounds? Oh, <laughs> there's going to be a commercial for Finest and Company. Oh, no, 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 King Cullen. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, King Cullen has a rather fancy, great collection of pomegranates today at 39 cents a piece. I was wondering. And also, on the painting, what kind of uh, brushes are you using? A sable. Sable brushes? Yes. I see. All righty. Uh, can you just show me that uh, pomegranate again? You want to see the pomegranate? Yes, ma'am. Shall I go pick it up? Please. Okay. You know what I'll do? We may have some time. Oh, this is going to be wonderful. I can, I can stop being the lecturing painter and I can be a, a vegetable man, a uh, vegetable lady. This is a wonderful, this is a pomegranate. And you can see it is, it is, um, I'm going to cut this open if I can find a knife or I'll just sort of tear it open and let the juice fall where it may uh, before the program is over. Uh, maybe, Dave, will you give me a few moments to tell me when I can open this pomegranate and show Bob from Port Jefferson Station what this looks like inside? Okay? Bob, are you still there? Yes, ma'am. My name's Carl, not Bob. Oh, I'm sorry. It sounded like Bob on the phone. All right. All Carl. right, Carl. Well, there it is. Are you perfectly content with what you've seen? Yes, ma'am. All right. Well, stay tuned, and we will have the pomegranate opening in a little while. All right. And also, <laughs> yeah. on the paintings, uh, what, what uh, backboard are you using on the painting? This is a very cheap, ordinary uh, canvas board made by the Marilla Company, and I've cut it. I cut it to this shape. It cuts with a razor blade. And I wanted a long, narrow painting, uh, which I simply took a larger one. And here is the rest of it, by the way. Let me show you. The rest of it is my palette. I so um, I cut corners, and this is, uh, this is a piece of ordinary, and I do believe that this is probably not more than a dollar twenty-five. It looks very good. Excellent. Oh, glad. I'm glad you like it. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thanks for calling, Carl. Don't okay. forget uh, to stay tuned for the great pomegranate. I will. Bye bye now. Good. All right, I dropped my brush. Hang on now. Um, well, it looks to a lot of people as though I have finished with this. However, I am going to be a trick a trickster tonight, and I'm going to do something that uh, people who know my paintings always want me to do. It's a sort of a signature of mine. I paint water drops. Uh, you may or may not have seen my work before, but water drops seem to be uh, enormously mysterious to people, very fascinating, and I will paint you a water drop this evening if we can get this thing in close enough to be able to observe something as minuscule as a water drop. And I think I'll put it on this pale uh, part of the pomegranate so that um, you can really kind of get a, get a load on how I do this. Um, a water drop is the only formulistic thing that I can really say happens in nature. It rarely changes. A water drop is a water drop is a water drop. And the way I found out uh, how to do it was, guess what? I put a water drop on a piece of fruit and did it. This is, it is always shaped the same way, shaped like a teardrop. Uh, mysteriously enough, the shadow side of the water drop is the one nearest the light. And it curves out, uh, this is a formula, this is the only time that I will actually submit to, a, to, to doing something formulistic. Because uh, through the years I've observed, this never changes. A water drop is always the same shape and does the same thing. So here, uh, once again, the insignificance of a thing of a like a water drop casts its own shadow. That's, uh, that's uh, a uh, rule 
of every um, living and unliving thing on the planet. It has a shadow, of course, if the light is out. If at, n at night, there's rarely a shadow. But if the lights are out, there is a shadow. I've used one color, as you can see. That's a huge water drop. Man, that, they really opened the hose on that one. Uh, this is much too large a water drop, but it's good to show you because making it any smaller would just be impossible to see. I'm going to give you the highlight. The highlight is not diffused. It is absolutely stark. It is a stark white pinpoint of a light, and there is another area of light, and this is very small. I should put my glasses on, but I'm not going to. I'm going to just show off and do it without my glasses. This area of the water drop becomes very pale. I have a phone call. Ah, maybe the water drop has brought out the water lovers. Yes, good evening, and who are you? Hello? Hi, this is Pat. Hi, Pat. Hi. Listen, I have a few questions for you. Number one, um, what do you suggest, raw or boiled turpentine? I never know which one to buy. Oil or turpentine? No, raw or boiled. Oh, raw or boiled linseed oil. That's what you're talking about. Oh, right. Because there is no such thing as boiled turpentine. Right. Okay, uh, boiled linseed oil uh, dries quicker than ordinary linseed oil by boiled linseed oil. Okay. Yes. And also, um, how do you keep the canvas board from warping? I always find after a bit of time it starts to warp, even if it's in a frame, the canvas board. Really? Yes. Do you live in a damp house? No, this is, you know, and in different houses too. I some of the paintings of my mother's and things, and I find they all warp. Well, I don't know. Just put another board behind it and nail it to the frame. I see. I don't know why it would warp unless you're buying really closeouts and they're kind of, kind of mildewed and no. really bad. No, no. Just no, you're not? No, over a period of time, like maybe five years, okay. ten years. All right. The answer to the problem is don't buy a canvas board anymore. Yeah, that's why it's stopped, but canvas yeah. is quite uh, expensive. You know, if you're painting and you're serious about it, buy real canvas. It doesn't cost that much. Go to Pearl Paint. You can buy a canvas for $1.99. It's this big. Right. You know, and if you don't want to buy canvas because you don't like the feeling of the texture of it, buy masonite and coat it with gesso. I see. And, uh, uh, masonite, of course, is puncture-proof. It's great when there are children around that, uh, that you know, that um, could injure something, okay. like canvas. And uh, what do you think about covering um, a canvas board or a canvas with a thick coating of gesso as opposed to leaving it, you know, toothed and plain? Is well, there any advantage to working on a smoother surface? It's a matter of taste. Matter I like taste. to work on smooth surfaces very much. Uh -huh. I like to have it really smooth when I'm doing a particular kind of painting. Right. When I'm doing a palette knife painting, I don't care about the tooth. Right. Uh, I don't care whether it's the canvas is as rough as a uh, burlap. Right. But when I'm doing this, a uh, very intricate, and portraits should have a very fine uh, surface. Right. And so it's all a question of taste. Okay. And also, um, do you believe in underpainting? No. You don't? No. Okay. And, um, what about working a painting, uh, particularly at the start, completely in some color, rather than working from back to forward? Do you find there's any advantage to doing say, that? Say that again? Working what? Working the complete canvas as a whole, as opposed to working, as you do, from back to forward. You always work in the, in the, far, in the far ground, and then you work close up. Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, yes, you start uh, with the furthest point. Oh, because I've known people to teach it otherwise, where you fill in the whole canvas with color. Uh -huh. To start, you don't yeah. go with that. Yeah, what's the point? I don't know. It's, I guess oh. it's just another technique. I guess kind of the where things are laid out to begin with, with some color. That's when you have failed to make composition an important part of painting, and you have. Uh, that's when the teaching has failed to uh, to include composition and drawing, and concept and selection. Okay. You see the basics. There are a lot of them, but the most important thing to remember is that you don't. Uh, you cannot apply color to canvas unless there is some kind of thought first in a number of areas. Namely, composition, well, concept first. That's the first thought, the idea. Then the composition, and then the atmosphere, the story you're trying to tell, whether it's dramatic or very plain or very calm or very excited. 
but all the elements should be taken care of before you start taking out a four-inch house brush and slapping on the sky. Okay. You know? And, and there's one other question. Is there is the turpentine you might buy in an art store of a better quality than, say, a gallon of regular turpentine you might get in a regular household paint store? They say it is. Uh, pure gum spirits of turpentine is what the label says on the art store turpentine. Right. Spirits of turpentine is all it says on the hardware store label. Right. Now, if you want to question pure, that's okay. I buy hardware store turpentine. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for calling, bye -bye. Pat. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I love to have my brains picked. Got five minutes. Well, let's just for an instant talk for a, a, for a, for a few seconds about this painting. Let me, let me continue a little bit more with what I've done here. I've got a, I've got a little bit of area which needs to be covered up. Namely, uh, the original drawing of this lime has left a pale line around it. Uh, once again, the, the properties of oils means that you can uh, work in an opaque manner and take out um, areas which are no longer useful to you if they have not been covered up with paint. Um, and then, of course, there is the signature business. Now, signatures are very interesting. I find that people who sign paintings uh, have a very individual way of doing it. I like to uh, do it in uh, my own handwriting because I figure that if anybody is ever going to want to bother to forge my paintings, they're going to have to have a problem to duplicate my handwriting. Uh, it's easy to print your name, and anybody could want to forge a picture, and it's very nice to think that maybe somebody might want to forge my paintings because they're worth so much. But anyway, I'm going to just sign it down here in my own hand. My brush is not fine enough, I think, for me to get it as small as I'd like to. A small signature is more tasteful than an enormous one. It should be proportional to the size of the painting, and a little tiny picture like this ought to have a very small and very subtle, almost, oh, well, almost, as well, it's, as, it's the same business as the initials on the Cadillac, should be really small, uh, and if they're big, they're, uh, they're gross. Oh, my brush isn't working, and so my paint, my, my... Thank mm -hmm. you.